Hello. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. I have the most fun presentation, not because of me, but because of the topic. I get to talk about AI and creativity, or specifically about the potential of the art, uh, of the art space and what artists and designers are doing with artificial intelligence and what it can offer for those of us who are interested in, in thinking about the field. And I will just warn you, uh, my name is Mimi, I'm an artist, I live and work in Brooklyn, I'm also Nigerian. If any of you know any New Yorkers or you know any Nigerians, you know we have a lot to say. We, we speak a lot. So I have a lot to say today. So I'm gonna go fast. I'm sorry, slow me down if it's, I know you're, there's, it's being translated. So if it's too fast, somebody wave, say something and I'll slow down. What do I, what do I point it at? Oh, well, okay. So we'll jump through. First off, the ramifications of artificial intelligence are already being widely felt. We already had a really great talk that explored this. Uh, we know that we're seeing AI in all of these different spheres of our lives. So the question that I'm trying to answer today is what role can art and design play in this space? And for thinking about this, I want us to think about a quote from the amazing thinker and writer Audre Lorde, who says, poetry is not a luxury. Uh, and there's a longer quote that she has that I won't say because of time, but I want us to know, to think about the fact that the necessity of being able to imagine different worlds and present things differently, that this is a really crucial work that artists and designers do. And we have to think about this because we have to make sure that we don't put this work on the peripheral of our discussions of, of emerging topics. And so here are the, uh, some of the things, some, just three, I think there are far more, but here are three of the things that I think that artists can do for us when it comes to AI. Uh, I think first, artists and designers can show us interesting uses, uses of AI and machine learning and general emerging computational tools. The second one is that I think that the work of designers and artists can flesh out new approaches to framing how we think about these concepts. And the third one is as a result kind of of the first two, which is that artists and designers make things that live in the space of the public. And so a lot of academics and researchers are doing very important work. I thought that, I thought that was telling me to slow down, okay? <laughs> uh, academics and researchers are doing very important work, but often that work lives in journals or is discussed in conferences that not everybody can attend. Whereas the work that artists and designers are doing, it, it's relatable, it's meant to be seen by the public. And so what that does is it opens up the space so other people can enter this conversation and think about things differently. And I'm going to show a quick example of this before I dive in and show more projects. So uh, has anybody heard of PredPol? Okay, a few people. Has anybody heard of predictive policing? Great, a few more hands. Has anybody seen Minority Report? <laughs> Perfect, okay. So predictive policing basically is Minority Report, right? You know in that movie, they try to predict crime before it happens. And that's what predictive policing is. It's using artificial intelligence to help you pre uh, predict where crime is going to occur with the idea that if you can predict where crime happens, you can prevent crime more easily. This sounds really, really great. It sounds like a fantastic idea. Uh, but there are some problems with it. And a lot of different groups and researchers have talked about what these problems are. Basically, they have to do with the data that's collected for it. So this is particularly in an American context. Who are the people who are going to be willing to call the police when something happens? It's a particular group. It's not always necessarily lower income people or immigrants or generally sort of vulnerable populations. So what that means is that the data that you get for it, uh, the data that you're using for a system like this comes from people who feel comfortable calling the police. It's never going to come from people who don't feel comfortable. That means that you're, it's going to be skewed. So what we see is that predictive policing, rather than predicting crime, it usually predicts where the police will go. And that's it, not crime at all. Uh, but this is sort of hard to flesh out when you first see it. It sounds like a great idea that there's crime and you can predict where it's going to occur. Uh, and a couple of artists, a whole group of artists really, started wondering how can we, how could they bring up this fact of predictive policing disproportionately targeting lower income people? And also the fact that the seeming neutrality of the technology would mask that fact. Uh, so group of artists uh, working with the new inquiry made this, which is a white collar crime predictor. So what it does is it takes, <laughs> it takes the exact same sort of idea and model that's being used by predictive policing, but it turns that on a white collar financial crime, which of course is mostly committed by business people and government professionals. 
And so they, they, they saw this whole thing through. They built the entire model. You can see this if you go online. It's, uh, it's Brian Clifton, Sam Levine, Francis Sang, and they did it in collaboration with this publication, The New Inquiry. And it shows you all of the places uh, where white collar crime is most likely to happen. And this project ended up having a really huge impact. Uh, they created this composite face of all of these different stockbrokers. That's what this is. So this is the face of white collar crime. Um, <laughs> And this project ended up having these huge ramifications in the sense that people, it went, it went really viral on Twitter, loads of people were talking about it, but also uh, people started writing them and governors were writing them and business people were writing them really afraid because they suddenly realized that the lens was being turned around on them, which is something that you very rarely see with these technologies. So this is an example of what I mean when I say that artists have this, this unique ability to be able to change the conversation around, around these tools. So a project like this, it's not reactive, it's proactive and it's provocative, and so it changes the way we even think about these things. I would say that there are really three different types of projects that you see uh, from artists uh, that approach AI, and they, they do these three different things. The first one is the most straightforward, and they're just people using AI to create objects, uh, utilities for artists and designers and other creative people. It's very straightforward, I'll show a couple examples of that, but we'll move on pretty quickly to the second one and the third. The second are artists using machine learning models or AI, like the models that, that, we, that we think about when we talk about AI, using those to do their own sort of investigations. Uh, which are really interesting. And then the third uh, are people who are using uh, their work to explore the implications of AI and sort of comment on different aspects of the field. So a lot of the issues that researchers and academics and policy makers and lawyers and so on are talking about, artists, are also, artists and designers are also talking about, but in this sort of oblique, interesting way. So let's dive into the first one, which I said is very straightforward. I'll just show a couple examples here. This is one, it's called Chroma. It's just an AI color tool for designers. Uh, what you do is you go through and you click on uh, 50, your 50 favorite colors. You just go, anybody can do this, this is online. You click on your 50 favorite colors uh, and then what happens is that it quickly generates these different color combinations for you. This is really useful for web designers and it's one of those things when we think about AI, we think about huge, gigantic implications. This is very simple. Oh, halfway, oh no. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay, so here's another project. It's called Terra Pattern. This is done by a whole group of people, Golan Levin, David Newberry, Kyle McDonald, and loads of others. And it came from this academic paper. Somebody, was, somebody wrote this paper about how cows in satellite imagery tend, to, you notice through satellite imagery that cows are always facing north. And he asked himself, well, what else could you see in satellite imagery? What if we could make a tool that would uh, allow us to really, make it really easy for people to see what things you can see in satellite imagery? So they did that. It's called Terra Pattern, uh, and it uses, it basically um, uses this ability of classification so that you can see all, if you click one area of a satellite match, of a satellite map, it will show you all the things that look similar. So for example, you can see things like, if you look at, Boat wakes, it'll show you all of the boat wakes in New York City, or all of the shipping container yards, or all of the cul-de-sacs. And it's just this, this kind of great thing of exporting this ability that not everybody would have access to, uh, leveraging AI to do that, and giving that to the public. So that's straightforward, like I said, that's just AI utilities for creative people. Then we get into an interest, more interesting space, I think, which is creative applications. So what are artists themselves actually doing when they're using machine learning or AI? Uh, a lot of this stuff has to do with music. The first project I'm gonna talk about comes from Harshit Agrawal, who's actually here in the audience somewhere, and somewhere here, and he did a, he, oh, he's in the back. You should co go talk to him afterwards. Uh, he did a residency here at the, at the museum, and so his projects are all outside. I'm just gonna show one, which is that, uh, it says here, he was creating samba music through artificial intelligence. <laughs> We don't have time to listen to more, but you can do that online. Also, I'm not Brazilian. I don't know if, it's, if it sounds good. <laughs> you tell me. Talk to Harshit, he's up there. And all, he's got a lot of great projects that really are about creating these tools for people to interact with AI through uh, artistic context. This is another project, uh, which is this sound maker. What it does is it allows you to choose one sound and another sound, and then you can combine them. It's using machine learning. You can. Great. 
that's what that looks like. Uh, and that's using a neural network that's trained on over 300,000 instrument sounds. Uh, this is another project called the Infinite Drum Machine. Uh, this is just taking thousands of ordinary everyday si uh, sounds. They're organized using machine learning. So you can see things like that. Oh, all the sounds that sound the same. Like an ironing board doesn't sound that different than a tape measure. Do this. Right, it's really fun to go through. I encourage you to, again, don't have time. Uh, can you turn the volume down a little bit on this one? This is another interesting project, which is that um, this artist, Ross Goodwin, actually trained this neural network on lots of science fiction screenplays, and then he created a script, created by like a, an AI screenplay. And then what they did, I don't know if you can fast forward in the video, you might not be able to. Like, maybe not. Well, what they did was they actually created a film. So there's this, uh, this science fiction film created by this AI. And it's, again, it's getting us into this kind of interesting space of a human creating um, an AI that's trained on all these things uh, that, that humans have done, and then now creating this artistic piece. I encourage you all to watch it. It is crazy. It's so strange. Uh, but they actually created the whole, the whole movie. And it's, so you, you can see that, see what that looks like. And also something interesting about all those projects is that those three, the last three, were all either sponsored or worked in, co in collaboration with Google. And so when I tell you that I think this space is really important, Google is definitely trying to position itself as the, the space where all art and machine learning stuff comes together. So that tells you that there must be something here. If Google is trying so hard to, to actually support and bring people in, that, that tells us something. Okay, I'm gonna go really quickly. This is another project called Invisible Cities. Uh, they basically trained this neural network to translate map tiles into satellite images in the style of certain cities. I don't know if that translated. That We'll see. Um, and so what you can do is you can apply the aerial style of a map of Venice onto an actual map of LA. So you make a map of LA that looks like, that's in the style of a map of Venice, if that makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, don't worry. <laughs> So here's, you can see this example. What you can also do is draw your own input and then generate a map based on that. So there's the input and you can see that's what that map looks like, would look like if it were in the style of LA and that's what that would look like if it's in the style of Venice. So any, anybody can do that. We gotta keep moving. Uh, this is a project I really like called Objectifier by Bjorn Carmen. And what it does is it actually shows you what it's like to train a, uh, like a machine learning algorithm and it does it in a physical way. So this is a really quick example. So you can see what they're doing here is training this to turn on and off depending on how you move your hand. And so the thing, what this video doesn't show, they have, there's a much longer video and it shows you just how difficult it is to train this. This makes it look very easy. It's not, and it's this physical device so anybody can use it. And it actually uh, shows us the stupidity a little bit, like the dumbness of the algorithms and that it takes so much work for you to actually train it. And it takes that and it makes it physical. Something that I think is abstract for a lot of us becomes this physical thing. It's very interesting. Okay. So now I'm gonna move quickly, and again, these are not all the projects, there are so many more, I'm just trying to pick kind of interesting ones. Uh, these are the projects that are sort of commentary, and they're commentary on AI, but also on automated decision making, and in general, all of the tools that are in this emerging computational space. Uh, and this is interesting, like I said, because the same conversations that you're seeing happen in a lot of other spaces, artists are dealing with in their own terms. So here is something, this just looks like uh, it's kind of like some, like some lines on the ground. But if you are, one minute, no. I told you, just, just give me like three more. Uh, <laughs> if uh, for a self-driving car, the, the dotted lines on the outside are lines that say it's okay to cross, but the, the straight lines on the inside say no, do not cross. So this is a trap for a self-driving car. <laughs> right. Uh, and so this is what I mean. This is actually playing with this idea of, okay, well, if we know what the rules are that these tools are going to use, can we exploit them? And what does it look like if we do? This is uh, another project. Stephanie Dinkins is an artist uh, who's been having these conversations with Bina48, which is that, that sort of thing right there in the middle. Uh, and Bina48 is essentially a chatbot, but made physical. So she's a robot, but sort of with this like chatbot kind of in, inside of her. And she's trained on 100 hours of data. And the thing that's kind of interesting about her is that they 
it, her, that they created this, this physical thing, but they made her a black woman. And a lot of the data that was put into it was from this black woman named Bina. And so Stephanie Dinkins goes and has these conversations with Bina 48 and tries to ask her about what it's like being a woman and about her blackness and about these, these topics. And of course, there's nothing, there's nothing that Bina 48 can really say about it because she's trained by this company. And also what Stephanie's doing is every time she has a conversation with, uh, with this, the chatbot really, she's now adding to the data that the chatbot is going to be using. And so there's this interesting push and pull where the company who's sort of behind can go and erase things that they don't want to be there. And so she'll just keep going and having these conversations and playing with the data that's actually used, to, that's used behind her. Uh, this is a project by Surya Matu and Tiga Brain uh, called Unfitbits. And this came from this moment when a lot of companies, if you had a Fitbit, they were using that to decide uh, sort of like you would get different health benefits or like uh, you would get different job benefits. So they said, okay, what would it look like to hack that? So if you want to get those benefits but you don't want to actually do the exercise, <laughs> this is something you can do. And then they also have this one where it's hanging from a metronome. <laughs> This is, oh, this is my project, uh, and this is, I call it the Library of Missing Data Sets, and what I've been doing is creating this ongoing archive of all of the data that we are not collecting. And the reason I do this is because there are patterns to the things that we don't collect. And I don't have time, I could do a whole, I have done whole talks on this project and what that means, but what it gets, at, gets us at is this, a lot of the AI systems that we're using, they're based on the data we collect. But if there are some things that we just can't collect or that we do not collect, that means that we are always going to have biased data, which means these algorithms are always going to be biased. So what do we do with that? So this project has lots of different, different pieces. This is the art part where I create, uh, I have this filing cabinet and it has all of these empty folders that people can go through and you can see all the different types of data that we're not collecting. But I also will work with people who come to me and say, we're missing this data, we wanna collect it. Should we, what does that mean? And I'll help them, I'm, I'll do like data analysis for them and clean it up for them and decide whether they should have that or we'll talk about why they shouldn't. And I'm creating this website, so if you know about missing data, I'll soon have it where you can add it, uh, it'll soon be live. Here is, oh, that's another picture. This is another one, uh, CV Dazzle is camouflage from face detection algorithms. And what's really interesting about this is Adam Harvey is using the language of privacy, but he's wrapping it into this sort of avant-garde fashion. So rather than being like, oh, let's make these tool, like clothing that just is about privacy, he's like, well, what if we tried to make it fashionable and just wrap that, like, this, this thing there, it's camouflaged from these face detection algorithms. What if we just wrap that into it? How does that change how we, how we think about these things? And here is, uh, this is, and this is great, here is, this is what I mean. He's got test patterns for stylists so that they can create their own based on the sort of the work that he's done. And then he's got his style tips for reclaiming privacy. And this is another project I really like, it's a bit old. This came from, uh, in 2012, LinkedIn had this huge data leak and loads of people's passwords were, were basically dumped out into the, into the space, the public sphere. And so Aram Barthral took all those passwords and he put them into these physical books. And so he exhibits them around the world so you can actually flip through and see if your password is in it. And you also see, they're all in alphabetical order, you also can see how many people have the same password as you. <laughs> If you go to the section with just password, you would be amazed at how many people, how many people have that as their password. And I really, I really like this project because it gets at this data subjectivity. What does it mean to actually see your data reflected back at you? So often we feel very, very divorced from it, but in fact, those things can be, <laughs> those things can be, uh, can be very tangible and real. Okay, there are so many more projects that I don't have time to go into. Um, sorry. But anyway, I'm gonna go, like I said, what are, what are the roles that art and design can play in this space? I hope you can see that it changes the way that we have these conversations about these tools. And I think it's really interesting, we're in this moment, a lot of the artists doing this work are, they know, they know how to, a lot of them are programmers, they're doing a lot of creative computational work, uh, and they are able to utilize the exact same language and tools as for-profit companies that are, that are building these. But they're doing it with completely different incentives and completely different goals of what, they want, <clears throat> of what they want to reveal. So I think there's something really interesting, and I want these to be more embedded in all of these larger conversations we're happening. So thank you very much for inviting me here to speak.